There used to be an old adage about you are what you eat. <laughs> That's not exactly true. But in some ways, spiritually, you are what you take in. In other words, what you see and what you choose to see a lot of times will influence what goes inside of you and what will change your perspective and change your attitude towards God, towards people, towards life, towards everything in general. Basically, the whole idea is that you're supposed to protect yourself from what you're watching and what you're doing and what you're seeing. In other words, you shouldn't be so inundated with constant violence that you become a violent person. You shouldn't be inundated so much with constant sexual provocation that you become a sexual pervert. You shouldn't be so inundated with constant political satire or political means that you're constantly being made aware of only politics. Because when you have a diet that's not well-rounded and well-rounded, then what you wind up doing is you become what you see. What you see is what you get. And that's the way it works spiritually is that a lot of times if you would choose to balance it out maybe even, to read the Bible, you know, to study the scriptures, to apply to yourself a balanced diet, even if it's just like, hey, you know what, I watch too much television so I need to take some of that time and use it for something else and look at something different. Or if you are on television constantly, then begin to realize and recognize what are your favorite shows? Are they always violent in nature or are they always sexual in nature? Are they dramas in nature? Are they uh, soap operas? What are they balanced out as? In other words, our society has changed dramatically because we have become a visually stimulated society that we take in but we don't know what we're doing to ourselves when we take in what we see. Most of society has changed their clothing, their conversation, their talk, and their walk based upon music videos. Sure, lots of generations have passed now since we had the first MTV music video, and you can already see the effect that just music videos themselves have had on people. Once people could see how other people were relating to each other in music, they began to imitate that and become like that. The same thing became true of the Simpsons or the Archie Bunkers or all of television as it began to bombard society and cause them to change in ways that they didn't dream that it would be possible for it to happen. And yet, some people warned us because Jesus said, if your eye be full of light, how great is the light within. But if your eye be full of darkness, how great is the darkness. So there were warning signs that had come out that had said, be careful about what you take in. And now that we've seen a couple generations grow up on television, we now have a digital generation that is constantly bombarded with visual stimulation of some type, whether it be texting, whether it be verbal, whether it be audio, whether it be through you know, media that is tabletized, or whether it's smartphone, whether it's computerized, whether it's digital, some way and some means you're being bombarded by information that's causing you to change and to reevaluate whether or not you've been influenced, propagandized, or changed by way of something you didn't realize was happening to you. Who are you today, and what have you become? It all is dependent upon what you've seen, what you've heard and what you've handled with your own hands. And that's why in Tozer we're reminded so much so about being careful about what we do with what information we get. You don't want to be constantly bombarded by people who will always tear you down. Because what happens when a person is torn down constantly is they no longer have hope. They despair. They become despondent. They become recluse. They become withdrawn from society. They even get violent at times and become self-destructive as well as destructive of other people. And that's not a good diet for you. When you're around those kind of things, you should remove yourself from that environment. And that's what we mean by be careful of the things you're taking in. Be careful of how you're arranging your life. What you are doing to yourself, you are allowing to happen to yourself because society will cater to you. They will cause you to choose and select what you want to become. 
And if you want to become like the world in its ways, going downhill and flushing your life away, then there will be more than enough opportunities for you to do that in the world. But as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, following hard after God, seeking to be the preservative of light as opposed to darkness, then you must choose to put aside some of what you're doing in order to focus in on what is right, what is good for you, what is profitable, those things that are pure, those things that are holy, those things that are be of good report. Those are things that you have to begin to counteract what's gone on inside you because you have probably, like most of us in our society of digital information, taken in a lot of seed, which is really weeds that have grown up in the garden of your soul. You have provocation points where you can be easily provoked into doing certain things because you've taken that in. You have sensitivities and awareness you don't know exists there until someone pushes the right button. And then suddenly you wonder, well, what happened? I thought I was a Christian. That's how it works. What you see is what you get. What you hear is what you are. What you speak is what you do. And what you've done is what you are paying for by the consequences of your own actions. Reality is that God wants to change that in us. Letting the will be the master of the heart. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father. Colossians 3.1 Because the will is master of the heart, it is important to realize that the root of all evil in human nature is in the corruption of your will. Your ability to make choice is what the will is. The will is your freedom, if you want to call it that nowadays, because people are into this whole idea about their freedom. Well, they don't have freedom, really. They have the ability to choose, to go to the left, to go to the right, to sit down, to be still, to stand up, to walk, to talk, to sleep, to act in certain ways, to suffer the consequences of their own actions, but also to behave in any way that they choose. But they will pay that price, dependent upon the society that they live in and the societal norms that mandate and regulate how we live and how we arrange our lives. So, in that, we find ourselves having to deal with what we call the will. Your will is your determination to make certain choices. My will is, and I've given it over to God, is to accept God's will in my life and let Him rule over me. And that's where I choose to be subservient to His will as opposed to my will. I choose not to do my will. I want His will be done. So you see, Making the determination in your heart is something that you have to choose the direction you would go. Moses said it best, and Joshua likewise, when he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods you know, of Egypt or whether you follow after God himself. And then later Joshua said, Will you choose you for this day whom you will serve? Because then you won't serve God, and you will fall away, but you make the determination now whom you will follow. And so... We all have to decide that with our own personal will, our own personal choice, or our own determination. Some people will choose not to follow Jesus. Some people will choose not to follow God. And that is a personal choice. That is the will, their will, to determine what their eventual outcome will be and they will suffer the consequences for it. As will you, dependent upon what your personal choice is and what you have decided with your will that you are able to make choices with. The thoughts and intents of the heart are wrong as a consequence, the whole life is wrong. If the thoughts and intents of the heart. Repentance, when you choose to go a different direction than what you were in getting saved is a matter of choosing to do something different than what you were in order to choose something that is better or something in a different direction. Choosing whether to go from heading north to south, heading from east to west, heading from down to up, heading from one direction to another direction. That's what repentance means, just a choice of a different direction, a course correction, you could call it, if you were driving or if you were sailing a boat, or if you were flying a ship. You're making a course correction. You have a destination, but you were heading the wrong way. 
now your destination is sure and you want to follow that trail or follow that path or follow that flight plan. It's primarily a change of moral purpose, a sudden and often violent reversal of the soul's direction. More often than not, our emotions determine our direction. Most of us in life make moral decisions based upon our feelings as opposed to intelligent decision-making process. Most of us can feel something and do it and go in that direction by way of choice as opposed to being able to control our emotions to sit down and say, well, yeah, you know, I really love this person, but you know, I'm not going to go and indulge myself in their flesh. I'm not going to participate in sexual sin, but I do love that person. Most of us don't sit down and think that way. We just go do it and then we pay the consequences. And sometimes those consequences last for generations. So making a determination ahead of time is what God is talking about when it comes to knowing that we choose not to be influenced by the wrong motivations of the heart before we get into those circumstances and situations where we would be influenced by our emotions. We want to have the right attitude of the heart and the right intentions in our heart before we ever get our emotions involved. And the way we do that is we program our heart. We cause by way of choice to use our mind to influence our heart by making our will, first and foremost, His will to be obedient unto the things that He's told us to do which is to study, to show thyself approved, to work with and need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Studying means reading the word. We made it sound all complicated just now as Tozer is explaining it in detail, but if you play it back, then you begin to realize what depth there is in just simply saying to someone, read the word. The reason is, is because when you're reading the word, you will see choices to be made inside of that Bible itself as it tells you what you should be doing with your life as you read it and apply it. It's not just a simple casual read, but it's an application to your life of the Word of God as it's alive and living and an entity that wants to come and change your mind so you would choose the right thing to do. To love God with all your heart, we must first of all will to do so. We must choose to love God. We must choose that decision-making process in ourselves to say, yes, I am choosing to love God. Not because I do, but because I choose to. We should repent of our lack of love and determine from this moment on to make God the object of our devotion. As you are devoted to someone, the more that you get your devotion, the more that your emotion will follow the devotion. As you constantly are aware, you'll see that repetition breeds a certain amount of feeling. And then as you constantly reinforce those feelings in repetitious ways, you begin to feel the feelings. It's amazing how you can actually program your physical flesh to feel something that your soul and your spirit may have already determined to do. And it can be done. The Way of Agape by Nancy Missler talks about a very positive way of looking at it and not a, a profess it, confess it thing, but rather to really reinforce what she decided with her and God that God was going to do inside of her and then she began to constantly work with that that she was going to love her husband and that she kept telling herself that she loved her husband because in fact of matter at the time that she was saying it she didn't but by the time that she had continually done that she did so a lot of times reinforcement of something that God is already doing and accomplishing by his spirit causes us to feel that what he's doing inside of us we should read the scriptures devotionally and set our affections on the things above and aim our hearts towards Jesus and heavenly things. As we read the word and we constantly agree with God because that's what he's doing, causing us to be changed into his image, then we become familiar with the word as we read it, hear it, and understand it and apply it to our lives. We begin to grow in that knowledge of Jesus and we begin to know it so intimately that it becomes a reality in our life the very words that are spoken in the book become the very words that we're living in our heart. And we do feel that peace. We do feel that love. We do feel that joy. Though at first we might not. There may be times for lots of people that when they get saved, they don't feel anything at all. And maybe down the road they still don't. But God works on that, eventually causing them 
to come to a reality of expression in their emotion from the devotion of being faithful to reading the Word of God and studying it and then finding that He meets them where they're at and then eventually the emotions follow. It isn't about faith not having emotion, but it's about there being a devotion of faith and the emotion follows that. If we do those things, we may be sure that we shall experience a wonderful change in our whole inward life. Our emotions will become disciplined and directed. We shall begin to taste the piercing sweetness of the love of Jesus. The whole life, like a delicate instrument, will be tuned to sing the praises of Him who loved us and washed us from our sins by His own blood. There is always that determination for you to choose what you would do. You always have that ability. You as a spiritual being have now that choice that you are no longer in bondage, but you can choose to operate in a completely different sphere of influence from the center of your being, which has a spirit that is likened after God, that can choose to love anyone at any time, anywhere, in any place, given the will of God in your life, who said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if God so loved the world, then by his spirit, which is inside of us, causing us to be spiritual beings, we can choose to love someone. We may not feel like it at first, but we can choose to exercise that gift of the Spirit, that nature of God Himself, that fruit of His very being that is in living inside of us, to love a person that we might not have loved at all when we first met them. And as we do, we will grow in that fondness which comes from the feelings that are accompanying that fruit of the Spirit. So you always have a choice. You always have the ability to choose. You always can decide based upon the fact that you are a spiritual being now and that you are not limited by only emotion or only feelings, but that you have a devotion that can come from exercising your personal will, your choice, your decision-making process to choose to be a son of God. And that's what Tozer wants for you, and that's what I pray that you would become a child of God, likened after Jesus himself, so that we would no longer be tossed to and fro with every woman doctrine and every type of political maneuverings and all the things in the world that crash and billow and act like rolling ocean waves that, you know, some rogue wave comes along and tips over your boat and capsizes your yacht, but rather we would be those that could walk on the water. And even the very storms of life, when they come, we wouldn't even notice because our eyes are fixed on Jesus and we would not doubt. For when we make those choices to follow Him, when we decide to put aside the world and its ways and to seek His kingdom, and we read His Word daily, then nothing can separate us. Nothing can stop us and nothing can change us because we're already being changed, transformed into the image of the incorruptible Son of God. And that's what we're becoming, just like Him. Thank <laughs> you.